the big Charleston contest. I am uh, Stefano. I am an Italian man. You've reached the house of unrecognized talent. You know why Joe B was so great? Because he was Italian? Well, that's part of it. Who cares about life? Who cares about me? Not me, that's for sure. I think it proves you're all daft. I suppose I'll get into trouble for saying that now. Toto, I have a feeling we're not in Kansas anymore. We're all pretty bizarre. Some of us are just better at hiding it, that's all. Well, New York City can think it, because we're number one! All people, everybody's continually searching for love. And that's why I'm doing what I'm doing. Mickey Mantle don't care about you, so why should you care about him? Nobody cares. Domo Arigato, Mr. Scotto. You never get it right, do you? You're either crawling all over them, licking their boobs, or spitting poison at them like some Benzedrine puppet. Just trying to enjoy myself. And welcome back to another glorious North Carolina evening. And um, after the doom and gloom of last time... <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah i get on these rants <laughs> anyway just following up in a little bit i was watching today a video of somebody showing clips it was it was it was critical it wasn't it wasn't it wasn't a positive it was a critical video of trump showing up places and then chants starting of we love you we love you we love trump and those sorts of things and then you know different uh popular pastors again i don't recognize these people but, uh, you know, saying things like, um, you know, God has raised him up and those sorts of things. It's, it's, it's rather insane. I mean, the one guy thinks he's the Antichrist. And we talked about him before. So I'm going to leave that where it is, whatever you think. Um, but again, I, you know, I remember I was I went to a rally for Ronald Reagan at NC State University in 1984. The height of his popularity. I mean, first first term was very successful. The economy had made a. U-turn in 82 going into 83 and then into 84 was on fire and he won 49 states in the 84 election but during the 84 campaign he came to NC State that fall and I went to see him and we're all excited to see him and everything I met Gaylord Perry at a rally the night before um at a barbecue rally <laughs> it was just kind of cool uh tell a whole story about how he was coming in in a helicopter and and um I was just standing there with a friend of mine and I just said Let's go run up to the helicopter. So we ran up to the helicopter, and they were all coming out. And there's Gaylord Perry. So I went up and escorted Gaylord Perry. We ran out from underneath the blades, you know, all the way up and shook his hand. And it was kind of cool because it was Gaylord Perry, a baseball guy. Anyway, in all that, and that rally at NC State, we weren't saying, we love Reagan, we love Reagan, we love you, we love you. We never said anything like that. Um, we were excited in him as a politician, as a leader, as a world leader. We weren't looking to him as the savior. And this is a distinctly different feeling that you get. But again, it happens on both sides. You had this uh, um, with other politicians that I won't name, but and that's the most obvious one. But I think other people have this idea of, of these savior politicians or leaders of any kind, whether they be in pri you know, private business or whatever, and they look to them, uh, billionaires and that sort of thing. And that's, that's a dangerous trend. So I'm just going to leave that where that is. Because we want to kind of get to Philippians chapter 3 tonight and point out a little more pointedly and some other more practical things. Uh, we were in Ephesians 4, and I can't wait to get to Ephesians 5, because when we do Ephesians 4, we're going to do Ephesians 5 and 6. But I was just reading Ephesians 4 again and you know, just jumping in at verse 20. But you did not learn uh, about Christ in this manner. This is about walking in the new life. We talk about your, your new nature and your old nature. And walking in the new nature. Uh, put off the former way of life in the old nature, which is corrupt according to deceitful lusts. And be renewed in the spirit of your mind. That you put on the new nature, which was created according to God in righteousness and true holiness. All right Now again, and then we talked about stepping into blessings by faith. And you have to step into the right blessings and the right calling. You can't step into any blessings and any calling. And this brings me to another thing I saw. Again, I come back to these verses because they constantly come out. Another guy today saw him on there saying, well, the reason God hasn't healed our land is because God's people haven't, you know, seven, Second Chronicles 7, 14. If my people, which are called by my name, will humble and pray and seek his face. 
read it in context. <laughs> I cover this on the blog. It's got nothing to do with the United States. And I said, you go read chapter six and chapter seven as a whole. Just the verses really, even around uh, verse 14 of chapter seven of Second Chronicles. You can't, you can't cram the United States in there. And that's, that's a problem. So, you know, I had to deal with that today. Uh, and that guy, people love that. Um, and, and then it was on the other side of the aisle, I had a woman telling me, she went, again, she was making a comment to me about abortion. Like, I didn't even bring up abortion. It wasn't anything about abortion. I just made a fairly innocuous comment. But obviously I'm on one side of something. So she she decided to attack me. I may have to get up here and let Rigby in. I think he wants to go in the house. Anyway, in the course of that, I mean, she accused me of all kinds of things, of course. And I was I was being light back to her. But, it, you know, she was saying that the right wing has controlled education in this country. And I'm like, are you insane? <laughs> are you, she was talking about um, curriculum of, about controlling slavery. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go put him in. So we'll get a, a jump cut here. Okay, we're back. Rigby has been secured in the house. Anyways, I mean, you're telling me that right wing has controlled education i said i've been i've been working in higher you don't even have to work in higher but i've worked in higher for 25 years if she thinks the right wing is in charge of colleges and writing curriculums and and teachers unions she's insane i said you have no idea what you're talking about again this is she's getting whatever see she goes and finds news sources that tell her what she wants to hear and uh, again we all look at our own news sources but you gotta be careful before you go. You know, do a little bit of research, anyway. But that doesn't take research. If you've been, unless she's been living in a cave in America, the left wing is firmly ensconced in control, particularly at the universities. You gotta be kidding me! I mean, you know, <laughs> you know, anti-Christian. I mean, this, you know, I saw some severely anti-Christian stuff today too. Um, I mean, again, somebody. Somebody wrote a, a the commentary on my on my book or read, read a, um, rated my book and re obviously they didn't read the book. There's no way they read my book. Called me a Christo fascist. It's a novel about some kids at a school. Yeah, it's got Christian allegory in it, but I'm hardly a Christo fascist. <laughs> you know, I give it one star. I'm like, well, if you would have bought the book, you know, I'll take your one star. But anyway, so but part of this again is stepping into that new life and the calling to which we're called. Meaning, uh, you can't just open the Bible, 2 Chronicles 7, 14, or whatever anybody else wants to open to, and you see the same verses constantly pumped out, uh, particularly from Matthew, you see all those all the time, and and say, oh, that's what I'm obeying, or you need to obey the, the red letters, and I'm always telling the red letter people, well, you don't actually read the red letters, <laughs> uh, and we've done that a number of times. But you have to call it the calling to which you've been called, and the different blessings. And if you're trying to function in the wrong blessing, it doesn't matter. Like I said, I can go build a temple, build a tabernacle according to the guidelines in scripture for the tabernacle um, or the tent <laughs> and then go in there and I, I don't have priests but you know find some Jewish people, <laughs> some Cohens who are supposedly descendants of Levites, have them sacrifice animals. None of it. You, you see where I'm going? Just because it's in the scripture doesn't mean it's for you and just because you're obedient to what's in that scripture doesn't mean that you're following your calling. I'm not going to get into it, but, you know, in Acts 19, where Paul runs into those believers, and they said, well, we, we're, we come under the, the, um, the teaching of John. Well, they were being obedient to whatever John was teaching, but then Paul had to tell them, you know, the Christ has come. Blah, 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 blah. You can read it, Acts 19. Anyway, they're stepping into the next level, stepping into the blessing, stepping into your calling. And we talked about this calling of this age was hidden and all that. We've gone over that with Paul. So, again, when you get to Philippians, and a lot of these things are taken out of context as well. And you've heard probably the enemies of the cross of Christ, but I'm going to read it now in more full. I'm, I'm going to start, I'm starting, um, I should read the whole chapter, but that would just take too long. So I'm going to start here in uh, verse 12. Not that I have attained or have already been perfected. Remember Paul saying he hasn't, hasn't attained perfection yet, uh, maturity. Uh, but I follow after, after it. I don't know, someone's behind me making noise, so I'm probably going to do another jump cut. Okay, and we're back. <laughs> All right, we're back to um, Paul saying, Brothers, now he's writing to the believers, Brothers, I do not count myself as attained, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forward uh, to those things which are ahead, I press toward the goal to, to the prize of the high calling, the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. And that's today, All right? This is a post-Acts book, Philippians. Therefore, let those of us who are mature 
be thus minded. And if you think differently in any way, God will reveal it, even to you, if you allow him. Nevertheless, according to what we have already attained, let us walk by the same, what you understand you need to walk by. Let us be of the same mind. Brothers. Context. Obviously, he's writing to believers, <laughs> and Scripture's writing to believers. Become fellow imitators with me, and observe those who walk according to our example, our example. Remember, this is Paul. Paul was given this special revelation. We talked about that last time. But all those in Asia that had abandoned Paul in 2 Timothy, not Christ, but they abandoned Paul, uh, even though Paul had the, the revelation for this age. said, uh, following our example, that's who we follow, Paul's example. For many are walking in such a way that they are enemies of the cross of Christ. Now, the context there is believers. said, you don't walk as those believers who have abandoned me, essentially. It's not pointing to the world. That makes no sense here. Brothers become fellow and of me, observe those who walk according to our example among the brethren, for many among the brethren are walking in such a way that they are enemies of the cross of Christ. Right? I've told you of them often and tell you again, even weeping. Why would Paul weep about the world? He's weeping about those believers, those brothers who have become enemies of the cross of Christ. Now, the cross of Christ is a way to say the sufferings of Christ. Paul was suffering. We, we see that later where Paul says, if you suffer with the Lord, you'll reign with him. And again, there's a there's a there's a couple things there in that passage where uh, you know people will say you have to do these things to be saved. No, because he says he says if you deny him, he'll deny you, is what that that passage says. And if you suffer with him, you'll reign. But then it clarifies and says, uh, but he cannot deny himself. He'll remain faithful. So even if you deny him, even if you leave Paul, even if you continue to try to live in the world and chase an earthly kingdom. You can't lose your life. God, Christ is still. He's honorable. He will honor. Right? And the Father will honor Christ's sacrifice. So that's an interesting passage there. And I'll put the reference down below to that. If you think, if this is just listening to the audio, you can go search it for um, reign. You know, if you suffer with him, you will also reign with him. So I think, again, prizes to be won. These are prizes and rewards. This is beyond just the gift of eternal life, just the gift of resurrection life. This is beyond that. This is a prize and rewards, crowns, those sorts of things. Remember, because Paul's weeping. It says, uh, their, their destination is destruction. Their God is their appetite. Their glory is in their shame. Right? Loss. Loss. Suffer loss, we read about. Their minds are set on earthly things. That has a broad meaning. Okay, earthly things. We read over in Colossians about uh, don't let anybody judge you in regard to a feast day or a festival or new moons or Sabbaths because those are earthly, right? <laughs> it's in uh, Colossians 2. It's my paraphrase, but you can go read Colossians 2. It says, why do you mind? Or, These are earthly ordinances. Ordinances that have to do with the kingdom, have to do with the earth. We're not concerned with those. And their end is destruction, meaning, you know, at the judgment, our work's going to be tested. And they're going to be tested by our calling. They're not going to be tested by the book of Exodus. They're not going to be tested by Leviticus and Numbers. Deuteronomy. They're going to be tested by our calling. They're not going to be tested by the book of Matthew. They're going to be tested by our calling, our heavenly calling. Not the earthly calling. Not working for that earthly kingdom. Right? <clears throat> Here it is. Their glories are shamed. Their minds are set on earthly things. But our citizenship is in heaven. That's the contrast. We talked about the heavenly hope. We talked about the hopes. The earthly hope, the new Jerusalem which comes down from heaven to earth, to the new earth. And then the heavenly thing, the heavenly hope that we talked about in Ephesians. Far above the heavens, where Christ sitteth at the right hand of the Father. Our citizenship is heaven, where also we await for our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. That's where we're waiting for the Epiphania, who will transform our body of humiliation. That's just a comparative for our bodies, compared to our resurrection bodies, that we may be formed to his glorious body, according to the working of his power. See, that's what we're waiting for. We're waiting for a resurrection change. We're waiting for the resurrection. And looking for the epiphania of his power to subdue all things to himself. Therefore, my beloved, this is verse, uh, chapter 4, verse 1. Therefore, my beloved, and long for brothers, my joy and crown, Stand fast in the Lord, my beloved. Stand fast against these brothers who are going to come along, enemies of the cross of Christ. We're going to just talk briefly 
Um, I'm going to finish here talking about what's happening now, but because I want to get that out. <clears throat> but let's talk briefly about the ordinances that most churches have. Now, baptism, people get hung up on. Water baptism is wizard immersion. Again, you can find people who went to seminaries. Guy goes to seminary, he says it's immersion. Guy goes to seminary, he says it's dipping. <laughs> Guy goes to seminary, sprinkling, and you know. So, again, it, they don't even agree on that. And they don't even agree on, on the meaning of it. But let's just talk about evangelicals. Now, they sing, What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Now, again, hymns aren't our source of doctrine, but that's what they're singing. And then they say, but they're really thinking, what can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus and baptism. <laughs> right? But remember, we talked about last time, there's only one baptism. Now, Scripture, you know at least two that we can talk about. Uh, baptism in the Spirit, which is given to you. It's a gift. It's what you get. Uh, when you come into the Lord, it's a, it's a big picture. We won't go into all that now. But you know that, the baptism of the Holy Spirit and then the water baptism. Now, let's look at Cornelius. Cornelius, uh, in Acts 10, the first Gentile who was grafted into Israel. We had believing Gentiles before that, but this is the first one who's grafted in. He gets the gifts of the Spirit, and that's what they're amazed at. Wow, he's got the same gifts that we have as Jews. Well, when Peter was preaching to him, the Holy Spirit fell upon him in his house. Cornelius, you can read in Acts chapter 10. And they started speaking in tongues. And Peter was amazed at this. And he said, wow, they've got the same gifts we have to his entourage of Jewish believers. He said, what's to stop us from baptizing them? And then they were baptized. So let me ask you, did they have the Holy Spirit before or after they were baptized? Before they were baptized, right? Clearly, Cornelius was a believer. And clearly, he was a believer. And clearly, he had the gifts of the Spirit and the Holy Spirit baptized before he was water baptized. We, we briefly talked about water baptism before. I'm not going to go into that here. And what it's, the symbolism is of that having to do with Judaism and the priesthood and those sorts of things. So we're not going to go into that here. But just on its own. So there's not, in this age, there's one baptism. And that's only that spirit baptism. Okay, we, we won't delve into that. But the other one is, is the Lord's Supper. Now, this is an interesting one because I come, I have, there's three different perspectives, a lot of perspectives on this. Again, people go to seminary, can't agree on this. <laughs> but they all have doctorates. All right. <clears throat> I grew up in obviously the Catholic Church where they believe it is, the Eucharist is the actual body of Christ, and the wine becomes the actual blood of Christ. It is Christ. It is worshipped. In fact, um, I remember as an altar boy, uh, they put the host in what's called a monstrous. Mon <laughs> monstrous. <laughs> it's, that's not monstrous. <laughs> Mon anyway, I'll type it out for you under here. I had monstrous on it. It's not a monstrous. <laughs> anyway, they, they put, they, they put the, a host up there, which is the Eucharist. It's in this giant gold thing, and it varies, you know, places. But this gold thing, things coming out, and you actually worship it because it is God. They believe that is Christ. It is God, right? And as altar boys, we would kneel on either side of it for hours, and then we take turns, and the other next altar boys would come, and you would do this, and it would be adoration. It's called the adoration of it. Again, it's been that was when I was a kid, so it's, you know, it's been forty plus years since then, and it is an acolyte. I was back in the late 70s, and I was an acolyte in the, in the early 80s. Acolyte's just an older priest. Older, he helps the priest more closely than an altar boy does doing mass, but it's similar. It's very similar to an altar boy. You're just older. You're, you stand up more than altar boys do. <clears throat> anyway, um, but let's go actually read it. No, well, the other two. Let me get the other two before I read it. I was in the Plymouth Brethren for 10 years. And the Plymouth Brethren do the Lord's Supper. The Protestant version of the Lord's Supper, just the bread and the wine, not, not saying it's the body and blood of Christ. They do it every week, every Sunday, perhaps at other events, but every Sunday. All right, so it's 50, at least 52 times a year. Because, they, because I'm going to read what they think is commanded them to do it every time they, they get together like that. <clears throat> now, the Baptists, and I've been in the Baptist church, Southern Baptists, they do it, and others do it, Presbyterians, I guess, and... and um, Lutherans, you have this thing called consubstantiation. Transubstantiation is the, the, the Catholic doctrine of it. It actually becomes the body of blood of Christ. Constance, consubstantiation is the Lutheran idea and similar high church where it sort of is the body of blood of Christ, but it's not really the body of blood of Christ. I'm trying to be as pedestrian as I can. And then there's just the symbolism that you would have in like the Plymouth Brethren and the Baptist. So anyway, just the bread and wine is the symbols. 
Well, the Baptists do it, and Methodists and Presbyterians, they generally do it every quarter, once a quarter. So it's four times a year. So the difference is between 52 times a year and four times a year. Well, somebody's wrong <laughs> right there. But you don't see, you wouldn't see the Plymouth Brethren, well, maybe the closed meetings, but you wouldn't see your general Plymouth Brethren you know, damning anybody, damning the Baptists or anything. They just think you should do it every week. So I don't, you know, well, it tells you how much stock they put in it. Anyway, and, and every quarter. Why every quarter? Just because it happens to work on the church calendar that they made up. There's no church calendar in the Bible. There's a feast calendar. There's not a church calendar for, for Israel. There is, but not for the, the body today. Anyway, Lord's Supper in 1 Corinthians 11. I received of the Lord that which I delivered to you. That the Lord Jesus, on the night which he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks. Now, the Lord went on that night. If you go back and read in the gospel accounts, he says, I have looked forward to sharing this Passover with you. It's a Passover meal. That's the night they did it. It's the night of Passover. And there's no lamb there because he's the lamb. Right? But he's, and then they're quoting there. It says, take and eat. This is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same manner, he took the cup uh, after, ha, after he had had supper. And he said, this is the cup of the new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Okay. And as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the death, Lord's death until he's come. And again, the Plymouth Brethren do that every week. Every week, 52 times a year. Right, and the Baptists don't. Anyway, uh, he said, Therefore, whoever eats this bread and drinks this cup of the Lord unworthily will be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. Okay, you're guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. Well, that's an unbeliever. He come in, he come into your mating and he and you warn him, you better be, believe, be a believer. Otherwise, you're going to be, you're going to be suffering right here. It says right here in the Bible right there and there and there. Well, Paul's writing to believers, and we're going to see that in a second. So he said, let a man examine himself, and so eat the bread and drink of the cup. Yeah, better find it. Better really be a believer. That's what they tell you. For he who eats and drinks unworthily eats and drinks damnation to himself. Condemnation. Not discerning the Lord's body. That's the thing. You have to, you have to really understand the Lord's sacrifice. For this reason, many are weak and unhealthy among you, and many die. So this would suggest these are believers. Now, let's say it's not. Let's say you're just letting a bunch of unbelievers come in. And they're eating and drinking unworthily. And they're drinking and eating condemnation of themselves. I don't know how they can be condemned more than they already are, right? They're lost, they're lost. So how are they more condemned? Right? But anyway, that's another reason to reason that it's probably believers. But even if you want to say, well, that's what that means. Well, what does this mean? You're saying, so for this reason, many are weak and unhealthy among you and many die? Who's seen that? So I was in the Plymouth Brethren for 10 years. I know a bunch of people have been in the Plymouth Brethren for much longer than that and still in the Plymouth Brethren. I don't remember anybody being sick and dying because an unbeliever came in and ate and drank. <laughs> or somebody took it unworthily, however you want to define that. I never saw that. This isn't going on. Right? And if you only do it every quarter. Anyway. And again, why take the chance? Why don't you just do it once a year? That means you can really have control over it. If you do it every week, you're opening yourself up to an awful lot of opportunities. As opposed to doing it every quarter. See the problem when you start, men start, you start seeing men's rules that aren't in Scripture on the Scripture. Right? And instead of reading what it clearly says. It says, but if we would judge ourselves, so here we go, suggesting this is believers again. If we would judge ourselves, we would not be judged. It's in the same context. But when we are judged, we are disciplined by the Lord, so that we would not be condemned with the world, all in context of the Lord's Supper. So my brothers, when you come together to eat, wait for one another. If anyone hungers, let him eat at home, so they may not come together into condemnation. Again, this is believers. This is our brothers. This is brothers. And Paul said, I will set the rest in order when I come. I'm not coming to your church. Um, <clears throat> anyway. So again, I just read over here in 1 Corinthians 12, it says, For one, by one spirit we're all baptized into one body, uh, whether we are Jews or Gentiles at this time. This is the grafting in. But anyway, there, that's a spiritual baptism, right? <laughs> I remember Paul says elsewhere when he says, when there's chaos in the church, in Corinthians, and he says, um, I'm glad I baptized none of you. Oh, what? <laughs> and why would Paul be happy he didn't baptize anybody? Because he says, I have the baptism of this one, and I have the baptism of that one, and I have the baptism of this one. Right? But if Paul ever said, I'm, uh, I'm glad I didn't preach the gospel? Uh, no. <laughs> I would never say that. Anyway, that's just something for you to chew on. 
Now I'm gonna finish with a little bit of funsies. It's it's a funsy version of what we talked about with the, the fall of America. Yes, <laughs> the funsy version of it. Um, I watched uh, some just shows on TV. Now if I got 25 minutes to kill, you can watch one of these shows pretty quickly. If I'm eating, you know, I can't do much else. So I've been watching The Outer Limits. Uh, Alfred Hitchcock presents the 20 the, the shorter versions. Well, Outer Limits is I think it's some, some of those are 45 minutes originals. Uh, anyway, and, and I started watching What's Happening Now. But the thing that struck me about, like, what's happening now, it's 1986. It's badly written, badly acted, um, but it's very pleasant, very, very joyful. Um, you know, you're not going to be confronted with anything horrible. And soon after that, by the 90s, TV, even sitcoms, had gotten very raunchy, where sexual topics were commonplace. Even started in the 80s with some of the sitcoms. Uh, but really, then you get, and see, that's with the decay. And, and when I talk about the Outer Limits and Alfred Hitchcock presents, Alfred Hitchcock presents started in the 50s and it ran into the early 60s. And then there was the Alfred Hitchcock Hour, which was, it ran into the mid 60s. You go from those, and then just within a couple of years, again, we talked about this with the Beatles, but just in a couple of years, you're suddenly having Hawaii 5 0. A gritty, much more gritty show. Guns, criminals, you know, much more intense. Uh, and even the whole look and the feel of everything had changed drastically, you know. And then, of course, when you get into the 70s, I always say you go from the Andy Griffith show, which ran from, what, 61 to 69 or something like that, eight seasons. Um, and then within a few years in 77 or whatever it is, you have uh, Three's Company, a guy living with two girls, a lot of sexual innuendo in a very short window of change there. OK, but even then, we've talked about this, too, and saying that uh, Three's Company is is tame compared to a lot of stuff today. You know, there's a lot of innuendo in that, but you didn't see anything. And there was always this end of the day that nothing really happened. And they always kind of made it clear at the end, nothing really happened. A lot of innuendo, a lot of you know, guessing and that sort of thing or misunderstandings, but nothing ever really happens. And that's always sort of made clear on there. Now it's nothing. I mean, Seinfeld, they're jumping in and out of bed with everybody. You know, even the characters on the show themselves, the main characters on the show. Uh, so anyway, um, but let me just finish off by saying all, that, all about the ordinances, they always have to do with the earth. They have to do with the Passover. They have to do with the, the kingdom on earth that they were expecting. Remember, remember that the kingdom is at hand. The kingdom is near. Paul says that in, in 1 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians 7, he says, don't bother getting married. Get married if you can't control yourself, but don't bother getting married. The kingdom's at hand tribulations upon us, you know, all those things are expecting the Lord's ministry, you know, the, the Lord's prayer. We talked about people call Lord's prayer. We talked about read that in the context of a tribulation. It makes a lot more sense than for us today. Uh, and, and the parousia that they're looking for in Matthew 24, 25, the presence of the king, the coming of the king, even in the, the parable, the wedding feast where, the, you know, the, the, the king is um, the, at the marriage and he's going out, calling, calling them to come in from the, from the dispersion to come back, you know, and those sorts of things. And it's always about this wedding feast with the Virgin Israel, uh, and then of course the bride of um, the bride, the Virgin, which is the New Jerusalem, which is which is uh, uh, redeemed Israel and separated Israel, and and again what we saw in, in Hebrews that we've talked about recently about the better resurrection, and those sorts of things. That's attained; those are attained things, as opposed to the sons sons of the kingdom who are cast in outer darkness. So again, you start to see all that has to do with the earth. And First Corinthians has to do with the earth. And then we con contrast that with post-Acts, where Paul is telling young women and, and widows, you need to get married. You need to get married and have children. But remember, the Lord said, pray that you don't, you're not heavy with child. When that tribulation comes, pray you're not heavy with child. But Paul's telling them, you need to get married and have children. Right? Because their expectation is different. Their hope is in the heavenlies. Right? Now, there's always persecution. Always persecution. But they're looking for an epiphania. The sudden bright appearing of the Lord as opposed to the parousia, the return of the king after a tribulation period okay going into a kingdom on the earth and then a judgment on the earth and then a destruction of things on the earth and a loss on the earth and then those that will attain to the better resurrection those who will attain to the new jerusalem those that will be resurrected to go into the kingdom and those who will not be resurrected till the end of the kingdom the thousand year reign of christ on earth and the 12 uh, apostles of the lamb who will who will have their names on the new jerusalem and they will sit on 12 thrones, judging the 12 tribes of Israel that the Lord promised them. So again, you're starting to see this, if you can, the difference between the earthly blessings and the heavenly blessings. So all these people now, all these preachers now, you know, talking about wealth and health and all that, 
or they're talking about Donald Trump has been son of God. He's the Joshua of this age or whatever they call him. Or the Moses. Uh, remember Jim Caviezel said recently, I'm still, G he played Jesus in the Passion of the Christ. We've talked about that. <laughs> but um, remember, it's not based on scripture. It's based on the uh, visions of a Catholic mystic, which they're, they're very open about it. If you read it, they tell you it's based on the visions of a Catholic mystic and not on scripture. Um, anywho, <clears throat> um, he said, he was talking about Trump, and he said, I'm still Jesus, but he's the new Moses. Now, both of those are blasphemous statements. And I know he means he's referring to his movie role as I'm still Jesus, but he should never say those words. Uh, I mean, I don't believe he's a believer. I believe he's a false prophet. A false prophet, not the false prophet. Um, although it could be. <laughs> uh, you know, and, and again, we I can go through all the things that I went through in 2004 when that movie came out, and all the things about Jim Caviezel and Mel Gibson and what their real goals are that they've stated, uh, that others have said that they've stated to them, and even today. Again, we talked about um, Sound of Freedom recently and my concerns surrounding that film. But it's very earthly focused, very earthly focused. Now, we live on this earth, so we have to deal and function here. Uh, but we have, to, we have to make sure that our calling, walk in the corner our calling, which is a heavenly calling, not to get hung up on earthly ordinances, not to get hung up on things of the earth, not trying to bring in the kingdom, not trying to cram the United States into Second Chronicles 7.14 or anywhere else in the Scripture. Not trying to cram ourselves into the blessings for Israel. Not trying to cram ourselves into the New Covenant. When we're not there, we've, done, we've covered the New Covenant numerous times. Uh, not trying to cram ourselves into the book of Acts. Where they sold everything that they had, the Jewish did, in Jerusalem. Uh, not trying to rewrite things where Jesus is starting in Jerusalem and then going, well, Greensboro is bad, Jerusalem. We talked about how that's what people do. They just take Scripture and willy-nilly make it whatever they want it to say. Um, you know, have you sold everything you had? But I'm willing to. Well, that's not what it says, you know. And even in the Gospels, the red letter people, Jesus said, sell everything you have and give alms, you know. Sell all that thou hast and give alms in Luke to, to the believers, little children, little lambs, you know. Not the rich man. He does that with the rich man as well, uh, the, the rich young ruler. But he says to his believers, if you want reward, I mean, and that's the thing. It's, it's an option. If you want this greater reward, sell everything you have, give alms. And you'll have treasure in heaven. Now, does that mean you're going to heaven? No, because it says when he comes back, he says, well, I, he goes, I'm coming soon, and I bring my reward with me. <laughs> you keep it up in heaven where nobody can touch it, right? Thieves cannot, cannot break in. Moths can't get to it. And then the Lord has it there. It's safe. And then when he comes back to earth, he brings his reward. And we see those rewards and all those judgments on the earth. In Matthew 25, those are judgments on the earth. When the Lord returns with his angels to the earth, you know, to his kingdom. These are the things. This is the Lord coming to the earth, setting up the kingdom, all the promises to Israel. And then you can't just transmogrified am over to the church it doesn't work like that and anyway, we've been over this a lot of times so I'm, I'm running through this quickly but hopefully you've, you've been following these studies for at least this season if not um all three seasons you can go look back at the others um previous ones anyway so we're going to cut out here and finish our weekend and again most of these are I'll, I'll probably faculty's coming back so i'm probably going to stop doing it at the university it's just going to be too hectic and too noisy and too many i won't find a place to do it in, in the short time that i <laughs> so anyway, i like doing it at home it's just uh uh, I don't know. It's fun doing on campus this summer. So we'll, we'll chat soon. Bye bye. Going my way to heaven. <laughs>